All right, you guys, I've decided I'm putting my phone in the microwave. Now, why would someone throw their phone in the microwave? That just sounds, it just sounds so bizarre to you or me, but it, it may not sound bizarre to someone who suffers from OCD. Now, you see, my brother, who, do, who do actually has OCD, thought that this was the best way to get rid of his phone, because where you and I might just throw our old phones in the garbage, him throwing in the microwave was actually the best option for him, because he felt that there was this minute chance that someone might be able to get that old phone and it's extract private data from it, and the risk for that was just too great. So, therefore, he felt that it had to be destroyed. Now, that might sound a bit obsessive, but in the mind of someone who suffers from OCD, it could just look, it could just feel totally normal and just the only option. Um, and now there's all sorts of ways in which OCD is different. You know, you might think of someone excessively washing their hands or following these strict orders or routines, but the spectrum is actually much, much broader than most imagine. Okay, now that being said, how can we best define OCD? I reached out to some experts to discuss this with me. Um, two components. One is the obsessions, so intrusive thoughts that the individual perceives as repugnant. So might be a really horrific image of a car accident or might be an obscene sexual thought that they find really disgusting. Um, and then the second component is the compulsions. So the compulsions are the repetitive behaviors um, or sometimes mental acts that people do in response to those obsessions. So the ones that are most popular are checking and counting, washing, um, but it can be lots of different kinds of very idiosyncratic things. Um, so you, if you have one or the other of those two, and most times people have both, then you would receive a diagnosis of OCD. They don't really feel an, a known sense of certainty, and that sense of cert uncertainty and doubt is what pushes them to continue performing their compulsions. OCD doesn't come alone. It comes with many different comorbidities, such as BDD, social phobia, generalized anxiety, and severe depression. OCD going hand in hand with other mental health issues, such as anxiety, I think rings very true for my brother. For example, before I even realized OCD, was even a thing. I remember at night, him going around check at night, checking all that the doors were locked, checking all the power points were turned off. Um, it, it probably wouldn't have crossed my mind to check these things more than once. But I guess once that, that seed of doubt is there, it can just grow larger and larger. And seemingly the only way to suppress it is to just, to just stick to those routines and just to ensure that they don't happen, even when in fact we know that they are complete. Father, I have sinned. OCD likely existed a long time before it was first actually diagnosed. And it's believed that the first cases of OCD were actually found back in, recorded back in medieval times with instances of people going to church and confessing, confessing these um, sins that they didn't actually necessarily do. It was just kind of like, oh, I might, I might have done it. I might have done this. And this would happen again and again and again with all these things that they didn't actually necessarily do. Another interesting instance in which OCD was written about in fiction was actually in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, spoiler alert if you don't know the story, but uh, Macbeth and his wife, Lady Macbeth, uh, kill the, the king. And as a result of this guilt that she has, she starts to imagine blood on her hands and she then has to like incessantly, she feels she has to incessantly wash her hands again and again even though in reality there's no actual blood, but she just feels that she has to because it's the only way she can get clean. So with this sort of general information, I think it is helpful in understanding OCD from sort of like a broad general standpoint. Um, but I'm still trying to apply this understanding that I have to my brother's situation, the way in which OCD, but how it manifests in technology. Like what are some examples of that? How does that, how might that look like? So imagine this, right? You might be uh, just surfing the web or just scrolling through your newsfeed and you might click on that, that view image that kind of covers up sensitive content or just you might just come across an image that might be sensitive or disturbing. And um, 
and you might just scroll on after that but then you might have that one intrusive thought that that might be like what or why why did i click on that that was disturbing and then that can just balloon into oh my goodness was someone monitoring what i was looking at was what i looking at might could that be considered maybe illegal or something or maybe maybe, maybe i'm some sort of creep or something like that and then that then that can lead to you know um going through internet history wiping everything or maybe even in some cases destroying your device your phone understanding the impact of things like a phone a smart tv or a laptop you know these things that surround us every day and what effect that can have on my brother's anxiety leads me to think uh what does his future look like is this disorder curable or only treatable will there be a time when he doesn't feel this overwhelming stress or will there be a time when he feels that he doesn't need to do these routines that he's constructed for himself so i guess my question is will he or can he break free what is what is there to help him one application is um, virtual reality and there's a psychologist in sydney named cory ackland who you're welcome to talk about who has does a lot of this in her clinic with people with ocd um, so when situations are difficult to access, maybe it's hard to do a contamination scenario. Usually we do exposure and response prevention in, in the real world, right? Where someone has to interact with, uh, you know, in the bathroom or touching toilets, touching the floor or whatever they're concerned about. They have to expose themselves to that fear for a long enough time that they learn that it's not actually um, as scary as they think. But when that's un, in, when you're not able to do that in the real world for various different kinds of reasons, or they're not ready to start in a real world environment, she has very highly tailored um, virtual reality programs where someone can immerse themselves in experience where they feel like they're interacting with um, contaminated materials or disgusting materials in a way to prepare them and get them to be more comfortable with that maybe, and then go out into the world and do real exposures. And our advancements in technology haven't just been beneficial in treating OCD, they have in a large way been very helpful in uh, the process of diagnosing OCD. So for example, uh, our electronic health-based assessments that we can now do, which is essentially just like an online questionnaire accessible via a smartphone or a, or a laptop, have been very helpful in the ability to diagnose OCD and it kind of, it does relieve an, an element of stress from patients if they say nervous about going in to get diagnosed to receive a diagnosis or or psychiatrists or doctors if they are heavily burdened by an, an immense number of patients for example and this has largely come down to our advancements in our machine learning and ai doing this project it's kind of made me think about about my brother's future like where is he going and as i said these devices that cause him so much stress that surround him every day and will probably surround him every day for the rest of his life. Um, it's hard to know what kind of resources actually exist to help him because OCD, like other other mental disorders, it's not as if um, you can just perform a, like a surgery on someone and then there's like a, a, a no, like a, I don't know, an 80% chance of success rate or anything like that. Because OCD, um, in, in most cases, it's going to be lifelong and it's going to have like ups and downs and Medications can always help. I, I would very strongly encourage medic taking medication if it's obviously prescribed by a doctor or a psychiatrist. But it's hard. It's very hard to pin down because um, some treatments work on people. Therapy works on some people. Therapy doesn't work for other people. Other people are comfortable with therapy. Some people are horribly uncomfortable with therapy. And it's just so. It's like everyone's learning something through the process. There's nothing that's set in stone that we know can work or will not work. It's all just a very, it's very hard to pin down. And um, yeah, and even in my brother's case, OCD and tech, it's like this whole new thing on top of OCD and that learning, that learning experience. Because um, yeah, it's much newer, uh, less people I would say probably experience that kind of relationship with technology so I guess that's interesting too, because a lot of newer re theorizing on OCD is about fear of the self, fear of you, uh, you know, the self being at risk or being dangerous or, and I wonder if somehow this cybersecurity kind of fear also um, represents that kind of thing. Like what will people find out about me and, and feeling like wanting to have some privacy and having an exaggerated concern about people knowing you or finding something out, even if there's really nothing to find out. So, yeah, it's hard. So it kind of makes me think what 
what's my what's my role in this do you know what I mean um, yeah yeah so ultimately obviously I don't know what it's like to live with OCD I don't I don't know those feelings of complete uncertainty and my brother's not not a child he's an adult and he needs to make his own decisions so I guess my question now is what can what is my role like I was saying before what can I do to make sure that he knows that he's supported and um, just to make sure that he knows that he's got people in his corner and people that he can depend on. Ultimately, I don't know what it's like to live with OCD. I don't know those feelings of constant uncertainty. And my brother isn't a child, he's an adult who needs to make his own decisions. So what can I do? I need to make sure he is aware that there are those resources available to him and that they can help. But also, and this is something I struggle with, I need to improve on, I need to be patient. Be patient, being patient with our friends and family who suffer. Because living with OCD is a quest for certainty in an uncertain world. It can control your life and make day-to-day -day living extremely difficult. So, be patient, give them love and support for those of us who don't get it. If they see a doctor or psychologist, encourage them to support themselves and follow their doctors slash psychologists advice. And the ultimate thing anyone can do for anyone else with OCD, whether they have OCD or struggle because a loved one has OCD, is remind them that they are not alone in this.